We're very fortunate to be joined by three experts for digital authoritarianism and media, mediatized peace in the Middle East. First, um, first to present will be Dr. Nahid Siamdust. Um, Dr. Siamdust is assistant professor here in the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at UT Austin. Her first large research project culminated in her book, Soundtrack of the Revolution, The Politics of Music in Iran, which is an amazing work I assign in my own classes. She has taught at Oxford, NYU, Yale, and Harvard, and her writings have been widely published. Next, um, we'll hear from uh, Andres Ilvis. After founding RFERL's Afghan service following 9-11, Andres Ilvis served as the first director of RFE's Radio Farda service for Iran. Andres then went on to spend over a decade at the BBC, where he oversaw BBC World Service programming for Afghanistan and Iran, and then moved to BBC Africa, spending eight years on the continent. Andres returned to RFE in 2021 as the director of the Near East region, where he is responsible for output in the Dari, Pashto, and Persian languages for Afghanistan, Iran, and Pakistan. And finally, joining us online will be Dr. Yuval Katz. Um, Yuval is a scholar and a poet whose works attempt to reorient peace towards the interactions of ordinary people. After living in Israel-Palestine for 30 years, Yuval moved to the U.S. to complete a PhD at the University of Michigan. His work focuses on mediatized everyday peace in Israel-Palestine. His research highlights peace happening in mundane interactions between ordinary people forged through and by media. So I think we're going to have short presentations on this panel and hopefully more time for discussions and Q&A. Are we all set to go? Yeah. So uh, Dr. Siamdus is going to kick it off. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to wait for a second for my presentation to come up here. But we've heard a lot about technology today, and that's all super interesting, um, very relevant to what I'm uh, going to be presenting. But I'm going to be ta uh, taking sort of a step back and talking really about the cultural uh, content that fuels some of the some of the um, uh, you know information and propaganda that the Iranian state um, tries to influence and spread. Um, so let me see if I can uh, start here. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to be doing today really, first of all, the, the last panel was so informative in terms of just understanding what Iranians have access to. Um, and I will say just you know, for our conversation that Iranians for the most part can access most things on the internet so far, as long as they have really good uh, VPNs, uh, virtual private networks, and those have become rare in recent sort of months. So it's become much more difficult since the um, protest started in, in September for Iranians to actually be able to get high quality VPNs, but they can still access most content online, even though, you know, uh, Twitter, Telegram, even Instagram now are blocked, people are able to circumvent those blocks and access content. And in fact, in fact, a majority of Iranians, uh, something upward of 80% are really spending half, you know, sort of they're living these dual binary lives where they're spending half their lives or half, you know, half a percentage of their lives sort of as we do in, in, in actual spaces, in real spaces, in public spaces controlled by the state, and the other part of their lives really on social media, where the kinds of restrictions that are imposed by the Islamic Republic don't hold, and hence um, that's really the, the interesting content and the space in which the state tries to interfere in creating a parallel content to really try to change the message um, and manipulate the message on, mo on especially sort of the viral content that gets around. So let me see if I can work this thing. That is not the right button. Nope, that is also not the right button. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, okay. So where do I go to get to the right place? Jacob, let me see if I can just do it from my laptop here. Thank you very much. So it's just the right button. Oh, I thought that's okay. So really, um, you know, what I want to talk about is how the Iranian state, following the 2009 Green Uprising, where Iranians mounted massive protests against the state, arguing that 
the elections had been rigged and that their presidential candidate had, in fact, the one whom they elected had not been uh, put in place of power, but Ahmadinejad in a rigged election. Uh, subsequent to the Green Uprising, which was that kind of protest movement, the state really realized the, the power of online spaces and social media uh, and entered the fray in trying to create content. Prior to that, I would say, you know, the, the internet wasn't really that um, powerful of a, of a communication space in Iran. And so the state kind of really, really tried to create content for its television programming, all of which is widely viewed by Iranians. So it's, it's content that a lot of Iranians watched, not just satellite television uh, programming, which is also very popular, but also state programming. So one uh, product of that was in 2015. This, of course, links to some of my work, uh, where they took a very a uh, well-known and popular rapper and had him basically sing a track about Iran's nuclear t energy, trying to sort of co-opt his cool cachet for the, for the message of the state. And let me see if this is gonna play. <laughs> This was really shocking to most Iranians because Tatalu was known as this sort of tattooed, you know, dissident rapper, and for him to appear on a frigate of the um, of the Iranian Navy on the, what's supposed to be the Persian Gulf, but it was actually filmed in the Caspian Sea, uh, basically spelling out, you know, the, the message of the Iranian state uh, was really shocking, but that's where the state was going. So there were state-aligned production companies that were really uh, producing works that were, that tried to co-opt uh, some of the elements, aesthetic and cultural, that we saw in the cultural underground, in Iran's culture cultural un underground. And again, this was all caused by Iran's green uprising where the state sort of clued in. And so we, you know, in the in the subsequent years, it really tried to repress this cultural underground. So internet spaces became a whole lot more, more restrictive, not because Iranians couldn't access them, but as soon but because as soon as somebody really accrued um, uh, you know, popularity online, whether it, through works of musical or other kinds of culture production, the state would go and uh, trace them and find them and uh, basically parade them on national television for apologies. And I will talk about that a little bit. But, you know, by 2019, you could say Iran's very vibrant cultural underground that had produced uh, incredible musicians who could still speak to Iran's Green Uprising in 2009, that cultural underground had more or less sort of disappeared and the state uh, state aligned production companies were now creating these discourses, co-opting again some of these elements such as hip hop, but really placing the state's messaging, um, the messaging of the revolutionary guards in within these tracks. And I have this track for you from 2019 where it really made the rounds online. And for most people, it wasn't clear that this was a state-produced clip, um, not least because at the very end of it, uh, perhaps that was really the giveaway, but at the very end of it, it says, director, 80 million Iranians. So in some ways, you knew, you know, this is the state trying to say the view of the state is uh, represents the view of all of Iranians. But just, just take a look at this. <laughs> So what you see there is a, um, you know, um, 
a conscript of the Revolutionary Guards really starting to speak on behalf of all Iranians, saying we're all part of the same family. You see this cross-generational pan of you know, passengers on the subway representing the Iranian nation, and all of them sort of in this train ride together. And it's the, the Revolutionary Guard soldier, the, the, who, you know, the protector of this nation, who starts speaking about all of them being uh, in the same boat and needing to stick together. Um, this actually became really popular, and um, you know, a large number of people I spoke to had no clue that this was produced by state-aligned um, production companies. So the state was really trying to get sort of this messaging out there without, uh, you know, without identifying itself. And at the same time that it was doing that, it was really going after actual independent producers online. The Happy Kids, who did uh, Pharrell Williams' Happy Dance in 2014, they were paraded on state television, as was Maide Hojabri, a teenage Instagram dance sensation in 2018, um, who with this image on the, uh, in the bottom is a little too dark for you to see, but who also was paraded on state television to apologize and say that what they did was wrong. Subsequent to their arrests, many of these people that you see precisely because of their um, arrest by the state actually went on to become sort of, um, you know, celebrities in the Tehran scene or, uh, or outside of Iran once they had fled to Turkey. So here again, this is an image, uh, you know, following Qasem Soleimani's um, assassination in Iraq of trying to present him as a general who represents a wide range of Iranians from very sort of, you know, hijabi on the, on the right side to the left, perhaps less uh, religiously sort of hijabi. And so trying to sort of co-opt uh, some of these elements within the cultural underground and represent the Islamic Republic as, as you know, the protector of all, not just um, the hijabis and the Hezbollahis, the ones who are really pro-state and state aligned. I think all of this really came to uh, to a sort of a break in uh, you know July 2022, which I would really point to as the starting point in some ways of the protest that started in September 2022 with the killing of Mahsa Jina Amini. Uh, Ibrahim Raisi took over in the most engineered elections in post-revolutionary Iran in 2021. And so this whole notion of uh, you know, reforms from within, which really the Green Uprising stood for, and people trying to change things from within, uh, was uh, gradually, uh, you know, kind of falling apart. And what we saw on state television, what we saw politically in terms of the structures of the country, the electoral structures and the, um, you know, governmental structures, was that there was this very clear imposition of the kind of state that the Islamic Republic uh, was leading, which left no space for reforms and which left very little space for opposition. And so this is, uh, um, these are two women who were on a bus together, an altercation happened. The one on the right was um, admonishing another woman who didn't have her headscarf on. The one on the left, Sapida Rashno, came to the defense of the other one. There was an altercation and the one on the right says, you know, just you wait, I have connections within the Revolutionary Guards, they're gonna come for you. And lo and behold, a couple of weeks later on state television, Sebide Rashno is paraded, um, visibly harmed, uh, not her usual self, we know, because there are tons of images of her on social media, as there are of all Iranians, or most Iranians on social media, because they have a very vibrant life on social media, on Instagram mostly, but also elsewhere, Telegram, uh, WhatsApp. And, and then thereafter, of course, um, Mahsa Jina Amini is killed, and what we see is, you know, the state really trying to create these um, discourses of good Iranian women being these girls who we see, these young girls who we see on the right uh, uh, during prayers with the Supreme Leader um, Ayatollah Khamenei and, um, you know, as being the symbol of the virtuous Iranian girl, the virtuous, um, you know, sort of Iranian women as opposed to uh, the women we saw on the streets burning their headscarves, dancing, you know, doing these bonfire gatherings and whatnot. And of course, readily on social media, there were parallels and um, comparisons to, you know, the kinds of gatherings that Mussolini and Hitler would create in order to try to change the image of uh, the popularity of the leader as well as what uh, really the ideal citizen entails. 
And I think, you know, because we're, this is a very short panel, so I know I'm out of time, just to sort of speak about one of the most resonant um, slogans of this, uh, of this protest movement has been, don't tell mom. This is when Mohammad Mehdi Karami, the one, the young man in the yellow shirt whom you see, he uh, was arrested in the protest and subsequently hanged. And before he was hanged, he had a phone conversation with his dad and he said, you know, my, my, my sentence is, that, uh, is execution, but please don't tell mom. Uh, and Iranians, of course, picked up on this as being just so heart-wrenching. And um, the man you see all the way on the left is the journalist who had that interview with the father uh, who told him about this conversation and he was subsequently also arrested. But really, uh, you know, the state trying to, uh, being very aware, these state production companies being very aware of the messages and the slogans that are so resonant and so powerful and trying to really create doubt uh, into the persons and the storylines that feed those slogans. So subsequent to this, uh, we saw, um, you know, this clip, which I, I don't think I have time to play, it's about a minute, but basically the state clearing, the uh, state aligned production company creating this clip where it says, don't tell mom that I was really violent and I killed this Basiji who was really just trying to protect the state. And so really turning around the meaning of don't tell mom. Don't tell mom that I'm being executed is more, don't tell mom that I was Bad. I'm actually ashamed of what I did. So really going sort of, you know, fine grained uh, sort of tactics of, of changing the message. And um, or do these messages have traction? Uh, does the state have any impact with the kinds of propaganda that it's producing both on TV, on national TV by, you know, through these, uh, um, pro the programming that it has, but also through these forced confessions on national television, as well as these memes and, uh, you know, viral sort of clips that are then circulating circulated on social media. I would argue that it doesn't. And um, uh, the reason is that, um, you know, there are still some uh, Iranians sort of in the gray area who, uh, you know, kind of haven't really perhaps made up their minds about what this, what is exactly going on. But the majority of them are on the same page. They understand that these are propaganda tactics by the state. And ultimately, the reason they don't have an impact is because while the state is trying to co-op the most sort of, you know, the cool cachet of the, of the culture underground, the political messaging um, of all of that, it's unable to extend that to the core parts of the messaging of the woman life freedom movement uh, and the opposition movement, which centers around bodily autonomy um, and ultimately the centrality of women um, and the, the significance of women to the liberation of Iran as a whole. And because they're not able to extend it that far, they are actually not successful. Not least, you know, they're, they're, they're basically preaching to their own. Those kinds of creations at this point are just there to, um, to uh, sort of assuage the, you know, the pro-state uh, uh, groups, which of which there, you know, I would say maybe something like 15 to 20 percent of Iranians are somehow, uh, you know, beholden to the state through their work, ideologically and otherwise. Um, but the reason that messaging can't really be successful is because the kinds of viral videos and images that we're seeing again have to do with this bodily autonomy that goes to the core of freedom from authoritarianism. And this is a most recent video clip that I'm gonna play part of, uh, a part of it for you. Uh, I don't know if, how many of you know the Calm Down Challenge, a song by Selena Gomez and Rima. Uh, it was a global meme, people around the world did this dance. And so these five girls from Ekbaton, uh, Ekbaton Residential Center in Tehran also did the dance. And what you see on the Right is them again being paraded on state television to actually not on state television, but being paraded to um, to apologize and cleverly so this was the apology didn't appear on state television as has been convention, but on social media. Let me see if I can. Oh. Nope. Okay, we're not going to see the dance, but maybe you can all look it up. Maybe I can stop here and pass it on to. Are you going next? Okay, thank you, Nahid. Um, we're going to move straight to Andres. That was really interesting. Um, so uh, let me just put into context kind of 
what it is that we're doing at RFERL in the region. I'm also going to talk about, besides Iran, I'm going to talk about Afghanistan and the Pashto-speaking part of Pakistan. Uh, somebody mentioned earlier geography and is Turkey part of Europe or where does Turkey sit and so on. And one thing that I noticed over time as somebody who's been interested in the region since I was a kid is that uh, where the books are in the bookshop have moved over time. So if you wanted to find a book on Afghanistan uh, in the 1970s, 80s even, um, it kind of was nestled between books on China and Japan and so on. It was always in the Asia part of the bookstore. And as uh, after 9-11, it suddenly found itself in the middle of the Middle Eastern section and the terrorism section and so on. And that speaks a little bit to why it is that Western uh, media uh, are even broadcasting, or and we'll get to the word broadcasting in a moment, but what is the point even and why would the UK, the US and other countries be broadcasting to the region? Because it's not inherently obvious. The BBC began broadcasting in Arabic in 1936 and it began broadcasting in Persian in 1940. Uh, and similarly, uh, the VOA began uh, sometime at the beginning of VOA's broadcasting after the Second World War. But uh, interestingly, BBC, for example, didn't have Pashto until 1980, which is right after the Soviet invasion. So this speaks somewhat to the, the interest in the region. And Afghanistan certainly isn't an area that the world was particularly interested in until the Soviet invasion. Uh, Frankly, it was actually one of the most peaceful countries in Asia until uh, that happened and uh, the war began there because of uh, the communist coup d'etat and so on. So what does this mean? Well, uh, how the West has treated the region in terms of its media and its broadcasting um, has been reflected as well in the languages that it broadcasts in. So the, the broadcasting in Persian was specifically for Iran, and they speak what you could call a dialect of Persian called Dari in Afghanistan, and most people didn't bother broadcasting in Dari. Uh, they kind of had a sort of Central Asia magazine, the BBC called it for many years. And what happened uh, is that, in fact, I was there in the 1980s, uh, RFERL began broadcasting to Afghanistan it didn't have anything for Iran, but it began broadcasting to Afghanistan in 1985, a couple of 15-minute broadcasts a couple of times a week. Slowly that increased, um, and that was very much in the time of the Soviet occupation, and it was called Radio Free Afghanistan. It was only available on shortwave, and uh, it broadcast information that you couldn't receive uh, during the time of the Soviet occupation, which very brutally killed about a million to a million and a half civilians in the country during the Soviet occupation. And that ended in 1993. After 9-11, RFERL restarted the broadcasting to Afghanistan, but did something very interesting, which is that it combined a Dari and Pashto program. And that was something very unusual, it was most, place, most international broadcasters broadcast by language. And RFERL, uh, it had actually done some of that in the 1980s, but it started an Afghan service. And that entailed all sorts of interesting logistical challenges, like equal airtime for both languages, but it basically put together a Dari and a Pashto program, uh, which as Matt mentioned, I was the first director of. So there you are, radio, RFRL has been doing broadcasting to Afghanistan for over 20 years now. Uh, radio is in the name of RFERL twice, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty. And what does that mean for us today? Well, radio isn't necessarily where the world is, and radio I know has actually been, other than historical references, it hasn't been really the primary thing that we're talking about at this conference. And in a lot of the world, you talk to somebody, it's like, oh, what, you know, like a teenager, what radio station do you listen to? And it's like, huh? because everything's on demand, everything's on the internet, like why would you even bother? But it is extremely important in the region. And at RFERL, we're broadcasting 24 hours a day to Iran. We were broadcasting 12 hours a day uh, to Afghanistan. And then we have now increased that to 24 hours a day. And then uh, for about a decade now, RFERL has also been broadcasting something called Radio Mashal, which is 
uh, in Pashto for the border region with Afghanistan uh, broadcasting in Pashto uh, to about 40 million people there who are Pashto speakers. And all of this is done, we do that with our uh, fraternal, sororal uh, sibling organization, VOA, uh, and uh, we often use each other's content and so on. So here we are talking primarily about digital media and how has that affected us and how, and how have we adapted to what Nahid talked about very eloquently in terms of the state, is that obviously global media has changed. Radio is very important for certain segments of the population, uh, but we have a population bulge. Uh, so in Iran, the median age is just over 30. Uh, in Afghanistan, it is somewhere between 16 and 18, depending on uh, whom you're talking to. And that has had a huge impact on how we do what we do, how we try to reach people, because you can put on all the radio broadcasts you want, and that's going to be important for certain people who don't have access to the internet, and don't have access to cell phones. But that's not really where somebody born in 2005 is going to be going to get their information. So increasingly important for us is our work on, uh, is digital work on the web uh, and social media. Social media use differs in the three countries that, that I'm working with. Uh, in Afghanistan, Facebook is very important. It's uh, less important in Iran. Uh, Facebook is also very important in Pakistan. Uh, Instagram is huge in Iran, but as Nahid no noted and has been noted earlier, um, now it's being blocked. I mean, Instagram was a massive thing for us. So we're trying to work around changing demographics changing media needs and changing media consumption, a vastly changing uh, population. I mean, literally, if you're talking to, a, if, if the median age is, let's say, 17, they don't even remember the name Hamid Karzai. It's like, what does that mean to your average young Afghan? Uh, and so we have to then also respond to events. The Taliban obviously took over all of Afghanistan in August of 21. Uh, and in uh, September of last year, we have the, the aftermath of what happened to the killing of Masa Amini and all of the protests. So we're trying to keep up, stay relevant. And in all of this, we're being blocked. So on, on various levels, one thing that had never happened in Afghanistan is that uh, is any form of jamming or blocking of the website and so on. And now that has been happening to us. We, in fact, had uh, transmitters that were set up uh, right after 9-11 in Afghanistan in tandem with radio television Afghanistan. We set up FMs around the country, which we shared with VOA. We had two uh, AM transmitters, very powerful ones. And for the first almost year and a half, the Taliban didn't touch them. And one day, with just a few hours notice, they shut us off. And so that has been a huge impediment for us in terms of trying to communicate. And we have lots and lots, if I can say so, uh, Radio Azadi, Freedom in Afghanistan, really some people call it the national broadcaster of Afghanistan. Everybody knows the name of that radio station. People would just tune in and hear our various programming, and then that went silent. So, uh, so we managed to scramble and uh, get a medium wave transmitter, medium wave or AM from Tajikistan that now broadcasts. And then we in fact doubled our broadcasting, as I mentioned, to 24 hours a day. And we're trying to basically get them what they need, which is what we've been doing since the beginning. Uh, we're based in Prague. One of the things that I'm actually here to do besides uh, attend this conference is to find some support for a, an innovative curriculum that we started a year ago which is basically an alternative uh, school for young people. I mean, the focus is obviously girls who are not allowed to attend school in Afghanistan above grade six now, thanks to the Taliban. But as somebody pointed out, uh, one of our listeners actually, it's not as though they'd be getting a great education if they were allowed to go to school. So in fact, um, we just have to offer an education to, to all people and we have to do it at a time when the men would tend to be out of the house and then the girls can tune in. And what we've been doing for a year now, and we're trying to actually really tighten it up and make it more effective, is a real proper high school curriculum. 
know, variegated by grade level and topic, biology, geography, history, chemistry, by radio, uh, doing it in two languages. So we're trying to do, for example, four subjects for six different grade levels in two languages and so on. So this is the type of crucial service that we're trying to offer. And now we're also going to be having it on the internet. Taliban doesn't like this. Taliban doesn't like the fact that we have female presenters. Uh, doesn't like the fact that we play music. And as a result, now they have blocked our website. So this is what we're facing. Uh, and in Iran, uh, we're also very well known there, and they're not very happy with us either. VOA is a very strong satellite television program. We have focused on radio since the beginning. Uh, but uh, everything that we do is blocked. Um, the regime really doesn't like us. We're very excited by, we actually really upped our Instagram game even before the protest began. We started doing that in August. Um, and then uh, just because we have changed the format, we shot up and have about, a, we increased the number of followers on Instagram by at about a million in a few weeks. Really great digital stuff. If you read Persian, please go to our Instagram account. But that's the context that we work in. Uh, and finally, in the Pashto speaking part of Pakistan, uh, our people who work there very courageously face a twin threat, which is quite unusual because in many areas that we've been talking about at this conference, you face uh, threats from the government that doesn't like the fact that you're working in open media and so on. But we are, our people face that threat from ISI and from governmental authorities. At the same time, they face a threat from extremists who don't like the fact that they are uh, broadcasting openly and have women in the programs and so on. So uh, it's really tough doing what we do. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of give a context of what I can speak to, which is um, RFERL's international media work. And it has changed so dramatically. I was thinking the other day that the image that you might have had, certainly in the Cold War and in the history of a lot of international broadcasting, was somebody leaning out a window and kind of with a coat hanger and a wire and trying to tune into a shortwave program. And in fact, what it is now is probably, let's say, an 18-year-old university student. She's waking up at 7.30, or, you know, you know, just like, oh, I got to get up, go to class. And then she's leaning over like all of us and looking at her phone. And through her VPN, she's looking at our Instagram account. But so that's just a kind of quick overview. I wanted to leave some time for us to um, then kind of have some discussion about this as well. But, uh, that's just a look at what we do. Okay, th thank you, Andres. And uh, finally, um, Yuval Katz will be uh, speaking to us via Zoom. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. I hope you can hear me. My internet connection is not amazing. Therefore, I think I will shut down my camera so you'll be able to hear me and hopefully everything goes smoothly. And just a second. <clears throat> okay. And so good morning. Thank you for joining me today for this panel. I'm Yuval Katz, and I'm postdoctoral fellow at the Allenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. And I will be presenting today on digital activist project called Bodegon and how it advances a new form of listening in, uh, to Gaza in Israel. So I want to start briefly by saying that uh, I want to start my discussion by briefly pointing out my motivations. And uh, when I was growing up back in the 1990s, peace uh, used to be a central, political, central to political discourse in Israel following the 1993 Oslo Accords. Uh, however, in recent years, particularly uh, following the Al-Aqsa Intifada in the early 2000s, peace has become a, a concept of the past with myriad of uh, new ideas and initiatives to reduce, shrink, or manage or contain the conflict, seen as a necessary evil that is simply a part of Israel's political life. And you can see several examples here, shrinking the conflict and what does it mean for as a new Israeli mantra, or the fact that uh, the State Department is kind of pushing uh, back on this idea of managing the conflict, or what you see on the left-hand side is the initiative to reduce the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. So peace is, seems to be kind of a, a concept of the past, and I'm trying to understand what it means today. Um, 
So my main intervention is to really talk about mediatized everyday peace. As in recent years, there's been a growing conversation on everyday peace. It is a theory of peace that no longer focuses solely on diplomatic negotiations among politicians representing nation states, but a theory that underlines local practices that push for peaceful resolutions at a communal level without dictations from, from states or foreign NGOs. Um, and I'm, what I'm going to, so this is not my theory, but today what I'm going to argue is that peace, is, uh, that media is a crucial space for conceptualizing everyday peace and think beyond it. Uh, again, uh, it is peace that is based on informal relations, happens among ordinary people. That is peace that is, is already taking place around us. So it means that we just need to look close enough to see it. It's not something that we're kind of trying to impose top down. And it is reflected in media texts and media practices, which is my main focus here. So again, based on informal relations, happens among ordinary people people takes place around us and is reflected in media texts and practices and very quickly these are some of the kind of some of the, some examples uh, illustrating that peace has always been and continues to be a basic principle for Jewish Israeli identity uh, so this is for Isaiah the idea that in the end of times will people will live peacefully with each other uh, or a uh, what you see at the bottom of the page, a quote from the Israeli, uh, from the Declaration of Independence, uh, where a very famous quote, uh, where Israel basically states that we extend our in peace for neighboring states. So this notion of Israel seeing itself as a peace-loving nation and Israel is seeing themselves as peace-seeking nation is very central, a very principle to is Jewish-Israeli identity. It continues to be like that. And here are some public polls that also demonstrate this point. Uh, what you see here is a, is a specific a, a public poll uh, conducted every year several times. It's called... Uh, I think that the peace thermometer uh, or the peace indicator and basically asks uh, is Israeli Jews and, and, and Arabs or Jew, Jews and Palestinians if they support peace. And if, what you see on the right hand side is that the majority of Israeli Jews continue to support peace. Um, so it's basically I'm, I'm tapping into uh, Raymond Milliam's uh, very powerful idea that peace has become a, a residual so social structure, that it is no longer emerging, it is not dominant, but it's something that is kind of fading away. And I'm trying to think what that means and how we can re reconceptualize peace through media. Um, very briefly, I don't want to get into this uh, because we don't have a lot of time. There are, there are plenty of uh, media theories that's, that, that focus on peace media events, uh, media witnessing, peace journalism, dialogue groups, uh, and amicable communication, most of them, maybe with the exception of dialogue groups, are really akin to the nation state. And uh, most of them kind of draw their inspiration from uh, journalism and see journalists as being kind of responsible for advocating for peace or reporting on things that are happening on the ground in a way that advances peace. And I'm kind of, kind of shifting away from that. So again, the, the, my main proposition here, my main argument is that media scholars are equipped with the necess necessary tools to grasp, analyze, concept and conceptualize everyday peace. And that various media forms, including popular text and uh, cultural industry practices, so I'm not only talking about media texts, I'm also talking about the process of making media, the process of, that brings media creators together where they have to kind of w walk through or kind of figure out what it means to live through this conflict by creating a creative texts and creative television shows, for example, that is, that is also a form of peacemaking. Okay, so overall kind of my book project looks at cultural industries, television shows, mainstream news, but today I'm going to focus on the digital activism part of it. And I want to talk briefly about the project that I've, that I've been investigating, it's called Bodegon. So the project I started is called Bodegon. It is a, a digital activist project devoted to translating stories written in English by Palestinian youth in Gaza to Hebrew to make them accessible to Israeli readers. Stories uh, are edited and posted onto the project's Facebook page uh, where Israeli readers have a chance to comment and have a discussion about these stories. It began simply as an effort to familiarize Israelis with life in Gaza, acknowledging that the average Israeli can, can often demonize people beyond the, on the other side of the fence after 18 years of suffocating siege that separates Gaza from the rest of the world. After almost a, a year of telling stories about ordinary life in, in the Gaza Strip, the project shifted gears and has become more political, advocating explicitly for the termination of the Israeli occupation of the Strip. Eventually, Bodegon became more political, giving the appropriate framework for the stories and explaining how life in Gaza is shaped by its military occupation. The project peaked during the May uh, 2021 war in Gaza when it became the only Hebrew-speaking news outlet focused on stories from Gaza. So what you see here on the right-hand side 
side is kind of basically the kind of de declaration of purpose uh, for this project, where they're basically saying we're a small media outlet that focuses solely on Gaza, and we're going to bring you stories from the ground, uh, interviews with people, um, TikTok videos, and so on. And for us, that and their main goal is to shake the Israeli mainstream media that basically ignores Gaza. What you see on the left-hand side is a really fascinating project that is Gaza-based. It's called We Are Not Numbers. And We Are Not Numbers basically gives a space for Palestinian youth to reflect uh, on, on, on their lives and, and, and to write about it in English. They have a group of mentors that help them in, in that process. And Bodegon basically started as a translation project. It, it basically took stories in English uh, and translated them to Hebrew. And then it shifted gears and basically, and basically became an independent media outlet with its own uh, journalists on the ground reporting what's happening in Gaza. So I think this chart really kind of illustrates the evolution of this project. Uh, so if you see it started on December 2019 uh, and, and continues operating. Uh, so from December 2019 until uh, October 20, it, that was the phase of like really telling more folkloristic stories. For, so for example, a Palestinian youth that are growing a beard or growing pets or dealing with overweight and stuff like that. So very, very relatable content. And Israeli commenters who read those stories at, at this particular period were, it, they found them very relatable. So wow, like they are, it's kind of sad to say, but that was, they are, these are all the same concerns that we have. This, these are very, this is very relatable. But I'm point, and I think when you engage in digital activism, there always comes a point where you have to think to yourself, okay, I'm I'm bringing more pe people under my fold, but do I really make an impact? Do I really change the political reality? And the people behind this project, and I interviewed them, told me, no, we, we realize that we need to be more explicit about our political agenda. So they, they had a break, and then they started becoming a, more of an outspoken a news outlet, which really peaked during the May 2021, uh, as you can see in this chart, during the war in Gaza. Okay, so very briefly, uh, my my method. So it was really a triangulation of various types of data. So I analyzed 116 posts on on the project's Facebook page, uh, ranging from when it was only founded until the end of the war. Uh, more than 20,000 comments on these posts. So I really wanted to see how Israeli readers were interacting with this content. I held 16 in-depth interviews with the project manager, so the people who started this project to manage it, which was which were both Israelis and Palestinians. That's a very key point that this was a collaboration, a very deep uh, collaboration. So as I said, uh, it, it started off as a, as a translation project. Uh, and many people who volunteered to work for this project were professional translators and editors who basically gave away from their time, invested their, their private time to 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 see to, to make this project successful. And I think the peak of this research for me personally was a digital ethnography. Um, during the May 2021 war, I happened to be back in Israel past time, I happened to be back home, and I joined the project and I became one of its kind of volunteers. Uh, and we were kind of thinking together about what to po what to post, how to cover what was happening in Gaza while we were watching all the kind of mainstream news talking exclusively about you know all the pain and misery that were happening on the Israeli side, which I'm not excluding, and I'm not saying that these are not important, but we're completely ignoring all the human suffering that was happening on the Palestinian side. So it was a really interesting digital space uh, with mostly text messages, but also a lot of multimedia items, so photos, videos, voice, voice messages. And I'll be more than happy in the Q&A to speak about you know, what it means to be a researcher in this very uh, sensitive digital space. Uh, so this is a really interesting example uh, from one of our correspondences um, in the internal WhatsApp group. The interlocutors here are two Palestinian contributors, Ibrahim, the Palestinian co-founder of the project, who is originally from Gaza, but is currently based in the UK. Aisha, who is a Palestinian with an Israeli citizenship, uh, who has many connections and family uh, in Gaza, and Yaron, uh, the Jewish co-founder of the project. Because the conversation itself is from the very beginning of the war when Israel started targeting residential towers with little to no warning to their occupants. As you can see, this is a multimedia conversation. We have mainly text messages, but also images and audio recordings. Uh, conversations are held primarily in Arabic, which is a crucial point here, although there are Jews on the group, which is something you very rarely see in kind of these type of shared spaces. And finally, uh, the conversation is a combination of information, really like what happened, what, what would be the consequences of this war as it just started on May uh, 11th. 
organization. Uh, so what are we going to do about this? And expressions of emotions, fear of these terrifying sites, making sure that everybody's family is safe. So if you can see that at the end of this correspondence, uh, Ibrahim, whose family is there, we're kind of asking him if he's okay and if his family is safe. So what can we learn from this project? So first of all, uh, beyond the wall, um, it seems uh, it seems that this project is living up to the original promise of the internet to connect people despite geographical and political boundaries. Members of the project, as well as visitors who read posts on social media, cannot visit Gaza, nor can, nor can they invite Palestinians to visit them. This project allows them to traverse and undermine these restrictions. Second, uh, digital solidarity. So we all know that the digital media has become a crucial tool for activists to organize, coordinate, and inform their communities. But there is something more to this project than these practical uses of social media. It has also become a space for solidarity where members, of, where members provide emotional support to each other in a situation of great distress. Uh, Non-reciprocal listening. Uh, the type of listening enabled by this project is also very unique, I think. It is not the type of listening we usually see in dialogue meetings, which were highly popular in Israel in the 1990s following the Oslo Accords, uh, where one side would tell a story, the other side would listen, and then they would switch. Here, acknowledging the fact that Israel is seldom encounter these stories in their ordinary media uses, this project is committed to uplifting Palestinian voices without expecting anything in return. And finally, the power of description, uh, pushing back on traditional approaches uh, to peace that usually prescribe solutions. Um, and they try to provide recommendations on how peace can be achieved. Here, the approach is descriptive, focusing on the everyday experiences of individuals, even in the midst of war, is believed to be a powerful tool that encourages identification with the other side and opens up a space for dialogue. That's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Yuval. So not only are we the line separating you all from lunch, we're already cutting into lunch. So I think we have time for maybe just one question from the audience and I'll, I'll see, you know, my questions. It's in the back. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentations. I have a question. What is the role of diaspora? Um, for the communities that you spoke about and can they use digital tools to counteract whatever it is that the governments or regimes who claim to be governments in these countries are doing. And then another thing um, about schooling for Afghanistan, it's something that I would just speak with you separately. Andres? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Speak quick, uh, quickly to the role of the diaspora in the Iranian case, which has been huge um, in good and bad ways. There's been um, diaspora have been um, you know, changing the information landscape, especially I think on social media apps, Twitter, and elsewhere in ways that is not always reflective of uh, what's happening on the ground, but they've also been extremely helpful in trying to bring some leadership to the movement and voicing some of those uh, you know, sentiments in a global way and trying to get solidarity from leaders around the world. And uh, so the role of the Iranian diaspora is immense, in part because there have been layers and layers of diasporic um, you know, uh, migration to the U.S. and elsewhere over the last 40 some years and uh, upward of 2 million perhaps Iranians living in the diaspora who have a lot of impact, who having deep connections with Iranians back home and having deep impact on um, a lot of the thinking and the conversations that are going on. Um, maybe time for one more question from the audience. Thank you all very much for your presentations. This was fascinating. Um, Major, uh, I'm Jess Dawson from the Army Cyber Institute. My question is, is you know, uh, the the presenta two of the presentations really focused on the education of girls and and the liberation of girls and bodily autonomy. How are we messaging to the men in these communities to help them see that this is a good thing for them as well, um, so that the girls and the women have have more allies in a lot of ways, if that makes sense. Yeah, quickly. Um, yeah, we don't want to sort of ghettoize women, and that's one of the first things we encountered when we started the broadcasting to Afghanistan 20 years ago was 
the obvious thing was, oh, we'll have a women's hour. But at this, okay, so does that mean, I mean, that's nice, but then I guess the rest of it is men's hours. So uh, one of the things we realized very quickly is that in order to kind of make the bigger point, then you need women in every aspect of the programming. And then, of course, the second opportunity is to ghettoize women because, oh, we have a program about babies or health or, you know, education. And so we really went out of our way to actually find women who could be in roundtable discussions about military policy and stuff like that. Um, and that's been one of the key things is, is, I mean, subtle, if you will. And at the same time, to also have men in the, in, when we do have women's programming, to have men on the panels and so on, because that is one of the dangers is kind of to just sort of, you know, as I said, ghetto-wise. And so we're very conscious not to do that. Uh, I would say in Iran's case, the men don't need that messaging because they're on board and they're very much along uh, with women. It's been kind of a national reckoning. It's been a real paradigm shift. Um, and this hasn't been a recent thing. Iranians have been, uh, you know, trying to reach liberation and freedom and justice for over a century and they've had several revolutions and uprisings to get there. And I think this is really a national reckoning where men are equally on board and um, that there's uh, no need for messaging from abroad really on that front. All right, please join me in thanking these wonderful panelists. Thank you for your patience and for staying with us. And I, I hope you, the conversation will continue over lunch. Thank you very much.